By what name are you known? There are some who call me... Tim? Welcome to another episode of Timmy Talks, the channel where we talk old school magic. And today we are in Tokyo, Japan, because we're looking at the old school magic championships of Japan today. And this is the final, so I'm really excited to show you this. It's the first time I'm showing magic from this part of the world. And uh, we've got two players playing Eternal Central Rules. They're playing, um, we've got Kaicho, he's, who's playing on Robots against uh, Mida Rumaru, who's playing on Atok. My apologies for my pronunciation. And like I said, they're playing on Eternal Central Rules. Now, before I kind of dive into the deck decks and discuss more what Eternal Central Rules actually mean, I would first like to point out that as always, you can also skip this section of the video, go straight to the actual games. The easiest way to do this is by checking out the description below, because there you will find several timestamps. One of the timestamps reads MTG Games. If you click on there, it'll take you straight to the game action. So uh, for now, I'm going to continue with the deck decks. I'm actually going to start with the deck of the player on the left. His name is Kaicho and he's playing robots. Let's have a look. And here we see the robots deck of Kaicho. Now maybe it's good to first let you know that when you're playing Eternal Central, there are a few different rules to, for example, Swedish that you see a lot on this channel. So Eternal Central is a format where you can play with four strip mines and you can also play with four uh, Mishra's workshops. So you see both of those in this deck. It's also a format where they play with Mana Burn and you can also play with Fallen Empires. Now, I don't believe we see any Fallen Empire cards in this list. And like I said, we do see four workshops and four strip mines. And of course, that also means that the opponent uh, will also be playing with four strip mines. And it's going to make it maybe a little bit more difficult for the robot player to get those uh, workshops to stick, but we'll just have to wait and see. Now, this is your typical robot deck, right? What this deck wants to do is just quickly deploy big artifact creatures, preferably the Triskelion, which is a 4-4. Four, four. Actually, it's a 1-1 one, one for 6, but it comes into play with 3 plus 1 plus 1 counters on it, so it's a 4-4, four, four, and it can take those uh, counters off and deal 1 damage to any target. So this is a very flexible and very good creature, and the cool thing about the robots deck is that you have access to animate that, and you also have access to copy artifacts. So I believe we see a full playset of copy artifacts in this deck. So uh, what this player wants to do is just deploy his Triskelion as soon as possible, start copying it with copy artifact. When the trike actually dies, he can use his animate dead to get it back. Now we only see one animate dead though in this deck, so that's not really a main strategy of this player. Another card that's really good in robots is the Abyss. So the Abyss is an enchant world from Legends that reads, um, each player has to sacrifice a non-artifact creature during the upkeep. Now, the cool thing here is, of course, that a robots player only plays with artifact creatures, so the Abyss only works for your opponent. In this case, it's gonna kill some Atox, so that is pretty good. Now, um, we also see four uh, IC manipulators in this deck, which is pretty cool. You don't see those that often in a robots build, so it's really meant to uh, kind of control the board. What I like about the IC manipulator is the fact that you can also use it to tap down lands. Now, remember, if you're already playing with four strip mines and you can like quickly deploy your IC with your workshop, it, it's going to be really hard for the opponent to get enough lands uh, to, to his disposal. You know, you can tap those lands down during the upkeep, and that's just going to make it really, really difficult for the opposing player. And also, there's one Armageddon in this list as well. So I think it's really that control, right? You want to control the mana flow with the ICs, with the uh, strip mines, and with that one Armageddon. And at the same time, you want to like build out your board really, really quickly with all the Moxen, with the Lotus, with the Workshop, and then, of course, with four trikes, but also four uh, tetravas. And that's quite cool. You don't see a lot of lists that play with four tetravases. I think tetravas is a very cool creature, but with my experience with playing with the tetravas, it's just too slow. But if you can get it to stick and if you can reach it to the next upkeep, because then you can take the counters off and make 1-1 one, one flyers, then it can be really, really good. You can do some really cool shenanigans with the, with the tetravas. So I'm really looking forward to see that flyer in action and to see how well... Uh, it will do here in the final. So this is the list of Kaicho. Now let's, oh, talking about that, he also has a sideboard, of course, with a few really good cards. Circle of Protection Red, Blue Elemental Blast. Those cards are definitely coming in after the first game. Okay, so this is the list of Kaicho. Now let's take a look at the list of his opponent. And here we see the list of Mida Rimaru, the Atok list. And uh, it's actually Atox with Setch Trolls. That's kind of interesting. Setch Troll, a creature for one red and two that comes in as a 2-2. But if you control a swamp, it becomes a 3-3. And you can also regenerate it for one black. So he is playing with Badlands and with Underground Seas. So that can kind of activate 
that part of the set straw because you don't really want to use it as a 2-2. You really want to use it as a 3-3. He's also playing, of course, with the two uh, usual suspects in black that a lot of players splash, Demonic Tutor and Mind Twist. But of course, his main focus in his deck is building around those Atox. So there are four Atox in this deck. Atox, one red and one for a 1-2 creature. Sacrifice an artifact and you can give it plus two, plus two. Now, the funny thing about the Atox is that, you know, back in the day when I was still a young Timmy, uh, nobody used to play with Atox, so it's really cool to see these very competitive and very good decks actually using this creature as a centerpiece. Now, Atox goes together really well with cheap artifacts. We see four Black Vice and three Ankh of Mishra. Now, I really like, I think, Vice in a format where, again, you play with four strips, so there's a lot of land destruction going on. And, of course, if your opponent doesn't have any lands, it's going to be really hard to play out anything. And Black Vice, of course, of course punishes the opponent for having a lot of cards in hand. You take one damage for each card above four. So if you've got six cards in hand, for example, you take two damage. If you have multiple vices, you take, of course, double that amount of damage. Now, Black Vice works really well with Ankh of Mishra. Ankh of Mishra is an artifact for two that says, if you play a land, you take two points of damage. Now, why does it work so well with the Black Vice? If you've got Black Vice and Ankh of Mishra on the board, you're kind of forcing your opponent to play out cards. Now, if you want to cast your spells, you need mana, right? So you need lands. So you're going to play out a land, but then your Ankh of Mishra will punish you for two damage. But if you keep your lands in your hand, you, the Black Vice will punish you for having too many cards. So it's it's like this catch-22 situation that I think uh, Mido uh, Rimaru wants to create here with his deck. Now, on top of that, of course, he is playing with the usual burn spells, Lightning Bolt, Chain Lightning, He's playing with uh, an Earthquake, one off, so that's kind of interesting. He's playing with one Shatter, um, and then, of course, he's playing with the Blue Power, and which, which is really good in the, these type of decks, draw seven. So he's playing with Wheel of Fortune and Time Twister. Especially Time Twister is really good because you can shuffle back in all your direct damage and then you can draw it again. And, you know, in a lot of cases when you're playing with a deck like this, you usually just need, you know, six points of damage more and you win the game. And then a Time Twister or a Wheel of Fortune can be great because you're probably going to draw into one of your... Uh, lightning bolts or chain lightnings to kind of finish the game, right? So that's really good. Then if we look at the sideboard, I think he's probably going to board in some more shatters. Maybe his uh, chain lightning number four, and he's also gonna, probably going to board in his, his red elemental blasts here. Although it's 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 difficult, you know. I, I think this matchup for uh, for uh, Mido Rimaru is, is going to be hard. He, he wants to be quicker than the robots player. The problem, of course, is that the robots player has access to the workshops and to all, you know, he's, he's playing with all the power as well. So it's really easy for him to have a turn two or uh, maybe even a turn one, Trike or Tetravis or a Suchi. And, and that's going to be kind of tough, right? Because uh, uh, Mido Rimaru has to then find a way to get rid of those bigger creatures if he wants to deal damage himself. So it's really going to be a case of, you know, can he control... Uh, the amount of lands and, and the tempo of the robot player because I think he wants to go faster, right, than his opponent. But that's going to be tough with this list. So I think, for me, the robots player is a slight favorite, but of course, a deck like this, you know, red with Atox and Burn and, and these very aggressive artifacts that just deal can deal a lot of damage, it is always very risky. Also, remember, if you have, for example, you know, two or three Black Vice on the board and you play a draw seven like Rule of Fortune or, or, or Time Twister, your opponent is guaranteed to take tons of damage the following turn. You know, that's also a very old school uh, combo, Black Vice with a Wheel of Fortune or a Time Twister. It's, it's a great way to deal uh, a lot of damage to your opponent and it can get really, really difficult uh, if you're playing against that. So this is definitely a contender, but for me, the Robots deck is a slight favorite because I think the Robots deck can go just as fast as the Atok player, but just simply will play out cards with more body. Um, and and that, that gives him a slight advantage, in my opinion, but that's just one man's opinion. So I would keep this on a 60-40. On Let me know in the comments below who your favorite is, who you think is going to win, and why. And now that we've discussed both of the decks, it means we're, we're, we are ready. Let's go to the Japan Tokyo Old School Championship Finals. Here we go. Game number one is about to begin. On the left, we have the Robots player, and on the right, we have the Atok player. I believe the Atok player is on the play. Let's see what they can do. We've got a little look in, uh, on the hands to see a Soul Ring on the side of the Robots player. Look at this. Starting with a uh, Mox Ruby, a Batlands, into an Ankh of Mishra. That means two points of damage here for the Robots player. This is what you want to do. 
I'm expecting him to deploy exactly to Sol Ring here. That means next turn, I believe I saw a Suchi in his hand as well. He can uh, play a Suchi. There we see a Factory dropping two as well. Chain Lightning, so he's really going fast. Putting the Robots player on 15 already. And of course, next turn, he can start attacking with the Factory. But here we... Oh, look at that! Workshop! There's the Trike! And next turn, he can start uh, playing out his Copy Artifacts. There's a Bolt on end step, so 10. You can really see the uh, the plan here of the Atok player. He just wants to get it done with, done and over with as quickly as he can. But like I said in the uh, in the deck deck, the problem here is that the robots player can ramp up really really well. And here is a pass turn with the Satch troll. So I'm expecting the robots player here to play a copy artifact. If if he's got two, he can actually copy it twice. First he's gonna play a land, dropping to eight. There's an attack. So he's going to block and regenerate. Then he's going to play out. Look at that. He's playing out a double copy. Now he can actually, and look at the Atok player. It's like, why is this happening to me? And now he can actually kill the Setch Troll if he wants to. He could take three counters off. But he doesn't. Interesting. He prefers to keep the counters. And I mean, the good news here for the Burn player is that, you know, his opponent is on eight. So he's only played one bolt, one chain. So if he can just find some more burn. It looks like he's thinking about that now. So what does he have in hand? The problem, of course, with eight is he still needs three of those burn spells. Of course, he also plays with psionic blast. So if he can find a psionic blast, he's going to tap three here. Ooh, I think this is a good move. If he can find, now find a Black Vice, for example, that would be really, really good. And what a fun finals this is. I mean, it's going quick, yes, but it's a lot of fun. I mean, both players doing so much in their turns, and they're shuffling up here. I mean, if the Atok player can find a Vice here, maybe even a double Vice, deploy both Vice, that would mean six points of damage, and then the Robots player will drop down to two. So this is going to be a really important draw seven. I feel like the Atok player needs some gas here. Or he's probably going to lose. I don't think that he's played a land yet. I'm not 100% sure though. Maybe he did. Maybe that Volcanic was his land for turn. There we see a Mox Emerald. Are we going to see a vice? That is the big question. An ATOC would be actually be quite good as well. Not super good, but I mean, it is a creature that as an opponent you have to think about. And I don't think that he's found uh, a vice or else he would have played it out already. He is playing out another land though. We do see a chain lightning in hand there. So he could chain, put his opponent on five. Oh, interesting. Chaos Orb. Passing the turn. Now, the problem, of course, with these Triskelions is even if you go an Orb Flip, in response, your opponent can still deal three damage. Now, the cool thing about Chaos Orb is, and I wonder if, if the players here know it, the ruling with Chaos Orb is if you activate your Chaos Orb, you don't have to say your target. Your opponent has to respond before knowing the target. Why is this relevant? That is because if he goes and flips the Orb now, the opponent doesn't know uh, what trike he maybe wants to uh, wants to go for. Anyway, first the attack here, animating the factory, attacking with three Triskelions. It looks like uh, we see a block here by the Setch Troll. And he's going to re... No, he's going to throw. And look at this. Yeah, so this is actually not the way the Chaos Orb is supposed to be played. But anyway, there's the flip now on the Chaos Orb. Is it going to be a hit? It is going to be a hit. So the trike is gone. There's the block. He's going to lose here. Take four, six points of damage. Yeah, it's, it's, it, he's dead, actually. Taking the counters off. That's it. End of the road here. And I do understand the time twister. I thought it was a really good play. He just needed to find his black vices there because he also had, I believe, a chain lightning in hand. So if it would have found like a double vice together with the chain, he would have actually won the game. So this was really close. A really fast-paced, fun game. 
Both players are now going to dive into their sideboards and we'll catch back up with them in game number two. Game number two here between the robots player Kaicho and the Atok player Mido Rimaru is about to begin. So the Atok player one game down. He's taking a mulligan here as well. That is not great. Let's see what he can do here. Starting with a factory into a soul ring and again the ank. So starting with the ank in both games, which is really good. Because that means you're, you're going to guarantee to do some damage. So there's the first two damage here for the robots player and the lotus. I believe he plays a soaring as well and what an opening again now he has to take a mana burn from his load is going to 17 but what an opener again so he's just going too fast here for the atop player that is the biggest problem okay we do see a shatter and he's also animating it attacking for two which is great this is a really good turn actually for the atop player and oh yeah of course he's taking four points of damage because of the suchi remember eternal central is with mana burn so suchi it's quite risky to play with actually. He would see an icy manipulator and things are looking quite good for the Atok player because again he can attack here with the factory. So he should take some damage by the way from the lands I believe or that's his first damage. He's gonna go yeah I, should, I believe he should go to exactly go to 16 here or 15. He's taking a damage from the uh, city of brass. I'm not sure if he took the damage for the volcanic for the city of brass I mean that he played out but okay anyway he's on 17 his opponent on 8 I think the robots player is in trouble here gonna drop to 6 here cannot keep up with the pace passing the turn there we see a draw step and these games are going so fast he's animating here keeping one floating playing an ATOC as well he's tapping down the set he's gonna take 2 points of damage he's gonna drop to 4 Okay, to five. I guess he was on seven. Okay, gonna drop to four. Yeah, I thought he was on six. So that means the end of the road probably next turn. We do see a blue elemental blast in hand there. I mean, he can tap down. Oh, he's got two blue elemental blasts. Okay, so that's not too bad. I think he's got enough to survive one more turn. There we see an animate. In response, we see a tap down of the factory, of course, because he cannot target those with the blue blasts. And then he's going to target it with the blue elemental blast, and that means he has to regenerate. Oh, he's not going to do it. Okay, so he's just going to drop to one. Or to two, because, of course, he doesn't have a swamp, so he only takes two damage from the set troll. There's a strip taking care of one of the lands, which is important because or else he could have gone gotten to six mana and played out, for example, a trike or the tetravis that he has in the hand. But yeah, it looks like it's pretty much over. There's the attack. He can tap one creature. What he can do here exactly, he can play the blue elemental blast. That means that he has to regenerate. And then he taps down the factory. So this gives him one more turn. But it's looking really good for the Atok player here. That means it's going to be a 1-1. We do see a COP red. Yep, that's it. End of the road. Yeah, there was just too much pressure. And I think that Shatter on Suchi was so good because it took away a threat and it, it dealt four points of damage to the robots player and it meant that he could attack that turn as well with the factory. I mean, that factory, he was able to play that super aggressively because he had that Shatter answer. So Shatter in this match, I think, was, was crucial. Anyway, we are on a 1-1. And that means we're going to do what I love. We're going to go to game number three. Game number three. Who's going to win this? Is it going to be Kaicho on Robots or Mido Rimaru on Atok? Who will be the Japanese champion? We're about to find out. And of course, we have the Robots player on the play for the first time. He is taking a mulligan, though. I do see an ancestral recall in hand, a workshop, also a mulligan here for the opponent of the Atok player. Look at that, just dropping a land in a past turn which is a very slow opener here. And there we see a Mox and a Chaos Orb, no Ank of Mishra. So both players kind of taking it easy. There's a workshop. He's able to deploy the Suchi 4-4 from Antiquities. Remember that Suchi, there is mana burn in this game. So if you kill the Suchi, you can deal four points of damage. So let's see if the Atok player here can find a Shatter. Of course, he can use the, uh, the Chaos Orb as well. Flip here on the Suchi. I think that would be actually a pretty good choice. What he can do here, exactly strip the workshop, flip on the Suchi. I think this is a good decision. Let's see if he hits it. Yep, 
Beautiful flip. Remember, four points of damage for the robots player, so he's going to drop to 16. Oh, of course, he can use the mana. Is that a, a Mishra's factory that he's got there? The thing is, he can then use the four mana to activate his Mishra's factory four times. That's what he's doing. So he's not taking any damage. And again, that is pretty important. Because remember, those four points of damage in game two were very, very relevant. Let's see if uh, the Atok player here can put some threats on the board. There we see a Black Lotus. I kind of feel that Black Lotus is not as strong in the Atok deck. It's, it's much stronger, I feel, in the Robots deck because of those six casting cost creatures there. He is second to Lotus, doing a Demonic Tutor, so keeping one Black floating. Looking up a card there, I wonder what it is. Cutting the deck here, offering that uh, to his opponent as well. Playing a Wheel of Fortune, love it! There's an Ancestral Recall. That's not going to be very relevant though. No, he has to discard. It's discard with the wheel. Be careful there, it's not a Time Twister. So both players drawing seven. And the Ato player hasn't had a land drop yet, I believe. So he can have a land drop here into Vice. No, just a pass here. Not even an Ankh. Not even an Atok. This is bad news for the Atok player. We see a COP red. Is he going to play that COP red? No, he's going to attack for two first. Going to put the Atox player on uh, 18. And then he's going to play a Felber Stone. So keeping the COP red in, in hand for now. A lot of copy artifacts there, but no really good targets for the robots player. Of course, he could consider start uh, copying his Mishra's factories. There we see a Setch Troll. So finally some pressure on the board. He's got the Badlands, means the Setch Troll is now a 3-3. There we see a Sol Ring in a pass. There we see the COP Red. This is pretty problematic. Remember, he's already played his Chaos Orb as well. But then, yeah, he's played his Chaos Orb. There we see a Vice. I believe five cards in hand there, perhaps, or four. No, only four, it seems, so no damage. Or is it five? It's hard to see. Anyway, there's the pass now. Exactly, no damage here. Four cards in hand. Now he's got five after the draw. Back to four again, back to three again with that uh, Icy. Remember, he's got Copy Artifice. Could consider copying the Icy to kind of control the board. No real need to, though, at this point in the match. There we see an Ankh. And coming a little bit late, of course, not so good in the late game. He does, of course, can feed it to the Atok later. So he is going to copy the uh, Icy Manipulator here. But we see a Counterspell here, Red Elemental Blast taking care of that copy before it hits the table. Now, the interesting thing about Copy Artifact is it also copies the color. So with Red Elemental Blast, you can counter it. But once it's on the table, you cannot target it anymore because it's no longer blue. I know it sounds ridiculous because it still looks blue, but it's no longer blue. I learned that the hard way, by the way, ladies and gentlemen. Anyway, there is a Atok here. I mean, he needs to get rid of that COP red. That COP red is the problem here. Going through the graveyard. I mean, if he can find a demonic, he can look up his, his, his COP. Sorry, his, uh, his Chaos Orb, I mean. There we see an attack for two. So this is interesting, right? Putting some uh, some pressure on the board and now the Atok player can activate his factory. Probably he's not going to. He is going to, so I'm expecting him to tap it down here. That's exactly what happens. Or play a disenchant, but I guess this is just a tap down. And he's going to pump it as well. So three points of damage here. Atok player dropping to 15. And I have to say, the longer this game takes... The, the bigger the, the chances are for the robots player to actually win this. His game is, is slower and more controlling. And when you're the Atok player, you want to play fast magic. And that's not happening right now. Only two cards in hand and a, and a pass. There we see a Suchi. And I, I mean, I think he can start... Putting up the pressure, he's going to pass turn, but of course on end step he can uh, he has a double icy open, so he can tap the the creatures on the side here of the Atok player and then just attack, 
and tap down a possible um, factory activation as well. And he can deal a lot of damage with the Suchi and the double factory. He can deal eight damage. So it's really not looking good here for the Ato player. Okay, there's another factory. That's something. But it's not, it's not great. The COP red is really a problem. Tapping down the two red creatures here on tapping. I'm expecting here just an animate. Exactly going to attack for eight here. And then upon activation, he's probably going to tap down both factories. Yeah, exactly. So he's, he's signaling, I want to activate them with my soul ring. And then he's going to tap him down with the IC. That means eight points of damage. He's going to drop to five. Or does he have a trick up his sleeve? Perhaps a bolt on one of the factories? Nope, he's going to drop to five here. And then he plays the Hercules Recall in the end step. So he's going to send everything back. And this is really nice magic because now he's got to discard as well. And remember the vice is on the table also. So this is a really well played and well timed Hercules Recall. Beautiful to see cards from the sideboard then do so well in that critical game number three. I don't think it's going to be enough for him though, but it is a very good move. And now he can untap. He can also deal some damage, of course, with his factories. So this is really good. Animating, just going to attack with everything. So he's, he's using his COP reds. And then he's taking four damage from the factory. He's going to drop to 14 past turns. Going to take three points of damage. Probably going to drop to 11 here. Exactly, going to drop to 11. And... I think here, when you're the Aether player, you need that little bit of luck to maybe find your second vice, to find another ank, you know, to, to, to put some pressure on the board. He's on 9, but again, that COP red is a problem here, because 9 is pretty close in burn range, I would say. But because of the COP red, he's kind of safe. The question here is, is he going to play out a lot? I think he wants to keep enough mana open for that COP red. Are we going to see a, yeah, a copy here? Interesting, only keeping one mana open. That is a little bit risky. I mean, this is interesting. He, he has double factory. He could attack with two... Wow, okay, let's see. This game is, is, is closer than I thought it would. It would get to. That Hercules recall really kind of changed a lot. That was a critical moment in the game. And remember... There's only one untapped land here. Or are there more? So he's attacking with everything here. Look at that. I think here that the Aetok player has just won it here with this attack. This is fantastic. Aetok player taking the victory. Destroying the robots. And I, to be honest, I thought up until that point with Hercules Recall... I thought the robots player was going to win, but the Atok player here has taken the victory. So congratulations to Mida Rimaru for winning here the Tokyo Old School Championships. Well done, my man. And that was the episode for today. I'm really excited. The first finals from a tournament in Tokyo. I think it's super cool. I would like to congratulate Mido Rimaru for taking the championship down. And of course, Kaichu also thank you for showing your skills. What a what a fantastic finals, you know. I really, really enjoyed it. And what I liked so much is that in game two and in game three, cards that came in from the sideboard were decisive. You know, you probably boarded in extra shatters in game two, that one shatter on Suchi was decisive. In game three, that Hercules recall was super important. So well done. It's, it's just great to see sideboard cards making such an impact because that really shows the tactical skills of the players. Now, I would also like to thank Nicolas for reaching out for me I, uh, to me. I guess it's I say Nicolas because he's French. So thank you very much. He sent me an email asking if I was interested in showing this match uh, on the channel. And of course I am because I love magic and I love that people playing old school all over the world. I know there's a pretty big scene in Japan, Tokyo. So it was my honor 
to show this match to you guys. Thank you, Nicola. If you want to reach out to the old school community in Tokyo, you can check out their Twitter account, twitter.com slash OS from Tokyo. And there's also a link to their Discord group in the description below. So if you're interested, take a look. And if you're in Japan playing old school, you should definitely reach out to these guys. It looks like a lot of fun. So once again, thank you very much, Nicola, for reaching out to me. It's been my honor to show you the finals. Now, before you go, I'd like to ask you to do three things. As always, please leave a like, comment on this video. What do you think about this type of magic? What do you think about Eternal Central? Um, and also, um, you can, of course, uh, subscribe and share this on your socials. I guess those are four things, aren't they? Anyway, if you're not a subscriber yet, please subscribe to the channel. It really helps Timmy Talks move forward. Now, before you go, I would also like to uh, tell you about the Timmy Talks Patreon page because I have a Patreon on patreon.com slash Timmy Talks, and there you can support the channel financially as well. So if you enjoy these videos, you can help me to keep doing what I love doing, that is making these videos for you guys. And it already starts with just $1 a month. So if you can miss it, please consider becoming a patron. Check out patreon.com slash Timmy Talks. And if you become a patron, you um, uh, your name will be mentioned in the end scroll at the end of every single video. Every video, including this one, including this one. Let's go to the end scroll. Ik het dus, ik het dus, zomaar gezien.